Remind me, uh, Frida checks, when are they actually meant to be done? Well, the Frida checks are really uh, whenever you've got a spare moment when you're flying a plane. Um, so every time you are just getting on top of everything and you know where you are, you've, you've uh, aviated, you've navigated, you've communicated um, and you sort of sit back and relax and think, God, right, I'm on top of the world now. I've now got five minutes to myself. You then just run through your reader checks and your reader checks are just basically uh, pure on sufficient um, uh, fullest tank. You, know, you might want to change tanks on some planes. Radio set to the correct frequency. Um, engine temperatures and pressures are okay. Um, obviously, at that point, you'd probably check for carb icing. Um, DI compass aligned. Altimeter set to the correct um, value. You know, the subscale correct. So when you say check for carb icing, do you mean just apply carb heat and see if the RPM fluctuates a bit? Yes, that's, that's right. Just um, periodically, you just... Um, apply carburetor heat just to clear any icing that may be present in the carburetor. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the plog and steps we take when things don't quite go to plan. I didn't have time. So first off, let's talk a bit about the, the plog. Now this is a typical Block that you would uh, fill out before you took off. And we would have our waypoints. We'd go um, from, say, Aquatiri Point November to, say, the dam. And from the chart, you would work out, you would just measure uh, the track in degrees. Obviously, that's true. You'd measure the distance and uh, you'd work out a sensible height you're going to fly it at. So what, when I'm talking about these waypoints that we're going to use, that we're going to navigate from, what sort of things Ross, do you think I'm looking for? What makes a good waypoint? One that's clear of obstacles and uh, difficult terrain like mountains, valleys, away from masts. Yeah, what is the most important thing about a waypoint? What do we use it for? Well, so you can see easily. Yes, well done. Yes, absolutely, Nick. Yes. A waypoint must be something you can see from the air. So when you're looking at the ground, um, it's no good picking a village if it's just one of 20 surrounding villages. But it might be worth picking a village if it's in the middle of nowhere. It's no point in picking a road junction if it's surrounded by other identical road junctions. And the same with rivers, railways, buildings. Um, so there's no hard and fast rules about what makes a waypoint. Is you use your skill and judgment to look at the map and you think, well, that waypoint, I'm probably going to be able to find from the air. And you would adjust your route accordingly when you're, uh, like, for example, if you pick waypoints that's in hills or on the top of hills, you can normally guarantee you're not going to be able to find them from the air because of the undulating ground 
will make that waypoint very obscured. So you just build this thing up in your head over the years of what makes a good waypoint. And you would then design your route around sensible waypoints. So from the chart, you would obviously measure the track with your protractor. You would measure the distance with your ruler, with your scale ruler, making sure, of course, you've got the right scale. And you work out a sensible height you're going to fly it at. And uh, normally you would try, if you're VFR navigating, you'd normally try to use the semicircular rule. So once you once you've got those things, you then go onto your CRP computer on your Wizreel. And you'd you would find out your winds from the Met Office and you'd look at your meters and taps and things and and you'd work out then what what your heading's going to be and what your ground speed is going to be. And once you've got obviously your ground speed and you've got your heading, true heading, you can then work out what your heading magnetic's going to be for that leg, and you write that down. And because you've now got the distance and you've now got your ground speed, you could write in here your time in minutes. It's going to take you to get from that point to that. And you'll continue this all the way through the log, through the blog. And you finish up with a total time. And then once you've got your total time that that journey is going to take you, you would then do your fuel calculations and you would then start to think about um how much fuel you're going to take uh in the aircraft um and then you you're going to be thinking things like um how much fuel you're going to need for your climbs your flight um some sort of fuel for your diversion You'd want to have some sort of fuel left after you've landed. Um, and you'd want to have some sort of contingency as well. You'd probably want to add 5% or 2% or something or, or, or something like that um, over, over and above what you need. So once you've done your uh, fuel calculations, you then come up, come up with a weight of fuel. Um, and because once you've got your weight of fuel, your weight of passengers and things, you would then do your weight and balance calculations. And you'd work out um, uh, where your centre of gravity is and, and whether or not that flight can actually take place. And if, of course, you've got plenty of space for fuel, you might well choose to fill the plane up to the brim, for example. You know, I mean, why, why leave fuel on the ground um, if you can? And of course, that might require a bit more um, calculating and, and things like that. And that's really how you would construct the plug before you, you took off. Once you've taken off, as we've already said, what you do is at every single waypoint, uh, as you take off, you would write in here your ETA at your first waypoint, um, which which you'd write is something. 
when you eventually get to Corey's Dam, you'd write your actual time of arrival in 08, for example. Uh, if this figure here was 12, your ETA to your next waypoint, you'd write 20. So now as we're flying along, we keep an eye on it until we're getting close to 20, and we would know that um, to start looking out for whatever this is would be somewhere in front of us. So what we're going to talk about today is the scenario of what happens is when we get to our time here, our two zero, and we look down at the ground and our waypoint's not there. Somebody's gone and stolen our waypoint. Or more likely, we've got the wind wrong and our waypoint isn't where we think it is. And then we look out to one side of the plane and we see our waypoint. And that's what we're going to, to talk about. So let's just um, let's just draw that on the board. That exact scenario, sure. So the exact scenario I'm talking about is is we fly from A to B C. These are our three waypoints. When we get to point B, we discover that we're not actually at point B at all. We are here. So what are our options once we've got? We arrive here and we look over to the right and we see B is over there. What sort of things could we do? Well, we could do two things really. We could either just fly to B, but that's not really very good. And let's face it, if we flew to B, and then we flew to C. We're still going to finish up over here again, aren't we? Probably. Because whatever wind we got wrong to get us to here, we're going to just going to keep getting that same wrong wind. A far better system would be once we've got to here and we know we're so we're a few miles away from B, we could then maybe rework out a new heading to take us to sea. So let's think up some typical, I'm going to put some typical um, figures in, into this diagram and, and we'll work through the maths together. Now this will appear in the in the exam. You will have well, you will have some of these questions in the, in the exam. Now the secret with all of these questions is draw the diagram and when you've been given the question is take the question and take every piece of information from that question and put it in your diagram. And then 
solve your diagram. Don't try and solve the diagram and the question at the same time. Take every bit of information and put it in, in your diagram. So a typical scenario is a pilot is flying um, from A to B and it's a distance of, of 45 nautical miles. And after 45 nautical miles, the pilot notices he is five nautical miles left of track. Point C is another 30 nautical miles further on. What change of heading does the pilot need to make at this point? in order to fly directly to C. So that is a typical question. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to solve this diagram for our track error. So this is our, this is our, our track error. this angle here. And we want to know what this angle is here. So if you remember, uh, we talked about this uh, last thing yesterday. So our track error is going to be equal to Forty five over sixty times five. Was that right? Uh, let me just make sure. Yeah, so it's like six point six six. Uh, let me just make sure I've got this uh, formula correct. Uh, this is a, uh, I haven't got that correct. That was, um, yeah. Was it 60 on top? Yeah. Let me just check that. Uh, in other words, if it was uh, 30, My mind's gone blank here. I've only been teaching this for about 30 years. Um, Paul, without, without, without trying to sound like a bit of a, a smart ass, why can't we just use trigonometry in the exam or coming? Well, you can do, but you haven't got a, you haven't got a calculator that's got sines and cosines. And, uh, sorry, yeah. Oh, uh, shit, really? Um, so this was. Uh, I make this bit bigger, my track error gets less. That's right, because I make this small. Yeah, sorry, I, it goes different. So my track error is 60 over 45 times 5. And uh, what's that in degrees? Somebody could just do that quick. Uh, Six, 6.66 degrees. Seven degrees, yeah? Yeah. So my track error here is seven degrees. Now we could also do the same thing here, couldn't we? Um, we could solve for this angle here. And uh, this angle here is going to be... Um, 60 over 30 times 5, which is uh, 10 degrees, yeah?
So let's so now we know we know that this angle here is seven. We know this angle here is ten. So let's have a think about what the relevance of that. So if I if I'm here and I turn because I know I'm 70 flying 70 degrees to the left if I turned right now seven degrees what would happen uh Danny you would overshoot to the right sorry you'd undershoot it now if, if I I know that I'm going I'm being I'm going wrong by seven degrees don't I so yeah. if I get to here and I turn right seven degrees. Yeah, you, you pass the left of seat. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I would then continue on this heading, wouldn't I? I would then continue here. Yep. Yeah? Because if I did nothing, I would go and continue up here, wouldn't I? Yep. Yeah? This is do nothing. If I turn, this is what would happen if I turned right seven degrees. So to get to point C, I'm having to go, I'm going to have to turn right by my track over of seven degrees plus 10 degrees. So I'm going to have to turn right by 70, 17 degrees. To, to give me um, to actually take my closing angle here. And I'm going to and my track error, I'm gonna to have to, I'm gonna to have to get them to and I have to add them together to give me a new heading to get me to point C. So which formula did you use for 60 over 45? Was that T equals D over S, but we don't have speed? No, no, this is the one in 60 rule, um, how we multiply tans that we talked about in the last class. Is that um, if you remember that uh, if you've got um, a triangle, where this is 60, this angle here is going to be equal to um, roughly um, opposite over adjacent. So if that was say four, this angle here is going to be four degrees. But only if that is 60. So if it's not 60, we have to work out what ratio it is over 60. So that's four degrees if that's 60. But if that if that's 30, Then this angle here <clears throat> isn't going to be four degrees. It's going to be 60 over 30 times four, which is eight degrees. Paul, so that normally you said it works off the, uh, the tan rules. Uh, do they ever in the quiz do they ever give us anything else that would require cosine or sine? So no, do they give us the hypotenuse sometimes, or is it always the adjacent and opposite? No, because if, if you think about, uh, well, a they're not that mean. B, I suspect that nobody, no members of the staff at the DCA even understands this, and um, and C is that, I mean, bearing in mind the real world application of this is that. Um, um, we're getting to a point 
here and we're looking to the right and we're saying that um uh ah there's where i should be and of course that's where you should be is relative to the distance from a to b not not here not um not this distance so it generally is the tan we're looking at so we'll run through another one of those um together So a typical um, exam question is uh, you're flying flying from A to C a distance of a hundred nautical miles. Say um, on heading, let's say two six zero degrees. After a uh, forty nautical miles. You observe you are uh, four nautical miles left of track. What's what's the new heading? To get to see. Right, that's that's a that's a typical kind of DCA question. So the secret with answering these types of questions is convert the question into a diagram. So let's draw the diagram, shall we? So we're flying from A to C, which is 100 nautical miles. Now, the mistake people make in solving these questions is they get the 100 nautical miles bit wrong. And if I were you, I wouldn't put the 100 nautical miles on your diagram because that's the bit everyone cocks up. So what I would do is I would, I would draw a line like this. Um, and here we go. So it's flying from A to C. We know that's 100 nautical miles after 40. So what I would do now is I, it's saying that we left the track. So I would pick a point here. 40 and I would write 40 here and I would write 60 here. And I wouldn't write the 100 in. That's my own way. The reason is because if you draw the diagram and you write 100 here, all right, if, if you were just doing this as an exam question, you would be tempted to write 100 here, wouldn't you? And then you'd go to solve it and you'd actually be working on 140, not on 40 and 60. Or you can actually just sort of like make a big point of, you can actually kind of do, you know, make it clear to yourself that, you know, it's 100. So we're flying from A to C, 
on a heading of 260 degrees. So we know this is 260 two, degrees true. After 40 nautical miles, you observe you have four nautical miles left of track. So this would be a typical kind of uh, DCA kind of exam question. So we already know that what we've got to do is we've got to solve these two angles. So we've got to find our track error here. We've got to find the closing angle here. And we've got to simply add them together. So our track error is going to be 60 over 40 times 4, which is, what's that? Uh, what's that? 10? Six, six. Six minutes. And our closing angle is going to be, so shout out the closing angle. Uh, four. 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 Doesn't need any maths, does it? It's going to be, that's six degrees, that's uh, four degrees. Yep. So that means that we need we need to do a, a change of heading of 10 degrees. Yep. So four degrees, change of heading 10 degrees. So if we start off as 260 degrees, then that means the answer is going to be 260 plus 10. So the answer is going to be 270 degrees true. Okay. So you, you can imagine you've got permutations on the theme of all of these sorts of questions. Um, <laughs> sometimes, uh, you might have to work the distance out um, based on the, the angle. Um, sometimes they will say you're right of track, in which case draw it down like this. Um, just, just make sure that you draw the diagram correctly. Let's move on to the next. Right, as a little tip for the exams, um, you'll be given a sheet of, of a working out paper, and you can ask for more sheets of working out paper. So what I would do is, if you've got your sheet of working out paper. The secret with all exams is keep your working out sheet neat. So as I walk in the exam, before you even open the exam questions, yep, Right on this sheet, T, Z, M, D, C, and then go W plus E minus W minus B plus U NOS and, and then you might want to write. Uh, if you don't know, well, you'll know ISA by the top, off the top of your head anyway. 
but right just right at the top of your exam sheet and your little aid memoirs that, that, that uh, you may have had to swat up 10 seconds before you walked into the exam right. then keep your exam sheet neat so what what i'd do is draw a line across it and then as you come across each question that requires a diagram just write And then you'd write. Do your calculations and draw a line underneath it. Question 10. Question 10 is going to be. Uh, a question about diversion. So you write down, so, you, and then you, in other words, make your working out sheet nice and neat like this. When you get to the end of the exam, you can reread the questions and just reread the questions and just check the questions against your diagrams. You don't have to re rework out the answers. Just check to make sure that all your diagrams are exactly as per the question. And then if you've still got time, you can then go back and resolve your diagrams. Yeah. Paul, are the exams mostly uh, problem questions like this, or is it like the, last, the others have been? There's a little bit of both, where we always going to be doing out uh, uh, problems. Most of the navigation exam, there's, there's of the 25 questions, you'll probably get five simple factual questions. Um, you'll probably get maybe five, maybe five of these sort of calculation questions. I would guess maybe eight. You'd probably get about five to eight um, questions about VOR and radio navigation, which is I'm going to cover um, on the next session. Um, but yes, you, you'll you certainly be getting quite a few of these, these um, maths type uh, questions. Um, you might well get some, and you'll get a couple of wind ones, a couple of wind calculation questions. Um, Maybe a simple question about ISA and you know the um, the nav nav navigation as a subject is is not actually a complicated subject. It's just that it's so big. It's just we have to cover so much, but nothing we cover is is complicated. Right, so I'm going to talk about uh, diversions next. So what a diversion is, it is, um, for the, is where you, you're trying to get from A to B and You can't get to B for some reason. Now, the re you can't get to B because B might be an airport and B might be shut. So that means you've got to divert to another another airport. Or quite often, if you're flying from A to B, something will happen that will require you not to fly direct. Uh, there might be an obstacle in the way. Um, 
sometimes you've been a bit bit of a pillar in the um, planning and you speak to air traffic control and um, air traffic control says uh, five five in G Yankee be advised danger area two three is active and you plan to go straight through the middle of it and um, you know state intentions Alanica approach uh, be advised I was just going to fly straight through the middle of the bloody thing Hmm. So, uh, or another reason is you might well find you've got bad weather. Um, you're flying from A to B, and this is this is this is your line on the map, and you notice that you've got uh, on route you've got sort of like lots of clouds here. Um, loads of clouds here, loads of clouds here, loads of clouds here. And clearly, you're not going to be able to get from A to B without going straight through the middle of a cloud. You've got to sort of kind of do a bit of a detour. Um, so you've got to do a detour sort of like over here or something uh, to miss these clouds. Now, the problem is with diversion is that we've got this in our plane, haven't we? And we've done all of our lovely maths and calculations and we've got our map on our knee. And um, as, as if it like ain't hard enough flying the goddamn plane and navigating the bloody plane, but suddenly in the middle of flying from A to B, we've got to fly off over here somewhere and then we've got to come back here, and then we've somehow then got to finish up at B. I mean, if that ain't a surefire way of getting you lost, I don't know what else is a surefire way of getting you lost, particularly since we're going to have clouds around us as well. So how on earth are we going to achieve this and not get ourselves completely lost? Well. Let's go back to school a little bit. We talk, I'm going to talk about an equilateral triangle. So so we know that an equilateral triangle is a triangle that has three equal sides and each angle of an equilateral triangle, Danny is Robbie? What well, each angle of an uh, 60? 60 degrees. And we know that each side of an equilateral triangle is exactly the same. So supposing I was going from a to B, and this was a distance of 10 nautical miles, if I turned left 60 degrees, and flew 10 nautical miles, And then when I got here, I then turned right through 60 and another 60. And flew another 10 nautical miles. We would actually finish up at point B. And if this was going to take me, let's say, um, 12 minutes to get from A to B. 
how long would it take me to get from A to B via here, via this point here? Ross, how long would it take me? Instead well, of what's, what, what speed are we doing? You don't know that. It's irrelevant. You've got, it, it would take you 12 minutes to get from A to B. But I'm not going to, I can't get from A to B. I've got to go via this point here. How long is it going to take me to get to B by detouring via this point here? Uh, well, I'm just writing, writing this down. What do you reckon, Nick? I'm having to work. Uh, 24 minutes. Yeah. In other words, it's going to take me 12 minutes here plus 12 minutes here. So it's going to, it's going to, it's going to double the time, isn't it? But what about what about the time to take the turn, and what if that takes you off that exact track you've got? Well, we assume that the time that it's going to take us to turn is going to be negligible, you know. So we've got three turns. We? We've got a turn. We've got a turn left. A turn to the through sixty. A turn to the right. 120 and then when we get to be a turn left of six and what we've done is we've added 12 minutes to our ETA so let's let's um let's look at that in a little bit more of a practical situation So this is where I'm flying from and to. And I get to here. And I discover that there's a whole load of clouds in the way. So when I get to here, I discover there's lots of clouds in. And this is the diversion I'm going to I'm going to need to do. And let's say, for example, we're flying a heading of zero nine zero. Just to keep it simple. And uh our estimate for point B is going to be, let's say, um, let's just pick a figure at random, four step, four, four. So 44 minutes past, we're going to get to point B. So I get to this point here, and what we do is I go, oh shit, loads of, I can see loads of clouds in front of me. I'm going to turn left now, 60 degrees. So what heading am I going to turn left on to? What's my new heading? Zero, three, zero. Zero, three, zero. So I now turn left onto 030, and as I turn left, I start my stopwatch, or I look at the time. And, I, and I'm looking out, out of my window until I'm happy that we're going to miss all the clouds. And supposing I, that's going to take me four minutes.
So now after four minutes, I now turn right through 60 degrees and I go back onto my heading of 090. So I'm now paralleling my original track. When I'm happy and I can see the clouds are now off to my right, I now turn right through 60 degrees. So uh, what's my new heading now? One five zero. One five zero degrees true. And I fly this heading for how long? Four minutes. Four minutes. Because I'm, I'm now making the two sides of my equilateral triangle. So after four minutes, I now turn left through 60 degrees onto a heading of 090 degrees true. And I ask and I update my estimate to point B. And how much extra journey time have I taken to do this entire detour? What's my new estimate for point B? Fifty two. Well, it's going to be 52 or 48, isn't it? What do you reckon, guys? Well, think about it. What 52. We, what have we actually what have we actually flown extra? Well, let's work it all out, shall we? Right. So this bit is obviously not extra at all, is it? So this leg, this bit's irrelevant. So let's just imagine here. So it would have taken me four minutes to get from there to there, wouldn't it? And instead of taking four minutes to get from there to there, I've taken four minutes to get from there to there and four minutes to get from there to there. So how much extra in the entire journey have I actually added by this detour? Can you see that? So it would have taken me, if I had, it would have taken me four, it takes four minutes to get from here to here to here, doesn't it? That's four minutes. If this is an equilateral triangle. But it said, I haven't gone from there to there. I've gone four minutes that way and four minutes that way. So in reality, I've only actually added four minutes. So my 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 new ETA is going to be four eight. Because you see you see the, the thing to remember is because we've turned left 60, so I'm already heading in the right direction here, and I'm already heading in the right direction here. So it's not like I've gone doink, 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 and I've gone through 90 degrees. I've actually gone through 60 degrees, so I'm only adding the time, one unit of time for however long I move, I turned left for, or right for. Paul, can you explain that one more time? I didn't quite understand why it's only four minutes instead of eight minutes. Okay, well, let, let's, let's run through that again then. Um, Right, well, this bit of the journey here, where I'm flying in the right direction, obviously doesn't, however long I spend flying here, uh, this leg, it's sort of completely irrelevant, isn't it? Because I'm flying in the right, I, I'm flying um, in, in the original direction. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, this bit doesn't come into the detour. Right, so, the only thing that we've got to think about 
is that I've flown this leg here and this leg here extra. That bit's extra and that bit's extra. That bit isn't extra because I would have to buy that anyway. So let's just draw that, shall we? Now, it would take me, imagine like here, it would take me four minutes to cover to cover that bit anyway. But I haven't gone there. What I've done is instead of flying from there to there directly, I've gone all the way up here for four minutes. And then I've gone all the way down here for four minutes. So it's taken me eight minutes to go all the way up here and all the way down here when I could have just gone four minutes to get to there. In other words, I have a choice to get from A to B. Well, let's call it A to B. Let's call it alpha beta. So to get from point alpha to point beta, I've either got to spend four minutes going there directly, or I can spend four minutes plus four minutes, eight minutes, going via this alternative path of the equilateral triangle. So surely that makes it 52 minutes then on the actual time, not 48. Right. <laughs> because... Isn't it eight minutes adding on? No, because I've only actually increased the journey time by one leg of the equilateral triangle because it would take me four minutes to get from here anyway because that's the way I want to go. So I've actually, I've actually only added um, one leg because bearing in mind that that. When I'm going up here, I'm still going in the right direction. If I did this as my detour and turn through 90 degrees, if I did four minutes here and four minutes here, that would add eight minutes, wouldn't it? That would be eight minutes. If I did two 90 degree turns, yeah? That would be eight minutes, but it's not. They're two 60 degree turns. Does that make sense yet? I've got a no, no, no. Um... Yeah, but it still seems like witchcraft. <laughs> I'll just have to take it as a, that, that's what it is. And I, won't, I won't question it. Right. Right, I'm going to fly this leg here and it's going to take me 10 minutes. That's so going to take me 10 minutes to get from here to there. So if I just flew from there to there, it would take me 10 minutes. But I'm going to fly 60 degrees to the left, and then, and then I'm going to turn right through 120 degrees, and I'm going to fly 60 degrees 
closing angle back here. So how long is it going to take me to go all the way up here and all the way back there? How long is that going to take me, Dick, to go all the way up here and all the way back down here? Uh, 20 minutes. Not another 20 minutes. If I, if <laughs> I can either spend 10 minutes going from here to here, direct, yeah? Or I can I can go all the way up here for 10 minutes and I can fly all the way down here for 10 minutes. In other words, this 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 journey here is gonna take me 20 minutes in total. So to get from here to here, I can either go directly, it's gonna take me 10 minutes. Or I can go all the way up here and all the way down here. Yeah. In other words, 10 minutes up there, 10 minutes there, and it's going to take me 20 minutes to, to arrive at that. <laughs> but it's only taken me an extra 10 minutes to get to there. This only works if it's an equilateral triangle and it's 60 degrees, obviously. This is why we chose the angles of 60 degrees. If, if I did something different, If I flew left here for 10 minutes, if I did this, in other words, I did a 90 degree turn, and then I did a 90 degree turn to get back, That would add 20 minutes to the journey because I, I would have this leg and this leg where I wouldn't be moving towards my destination. So this would just be simply adding two lots of 10 minutes as a straight detour. But when I'm turning left on my equilateral triangle, Bearing in mind, I'm still actually heading towards my destination. So it's not like I'm losing all that time. And that's the miracle of the equilateral triangle. And we do this trick in, in uh, boats as well when, when I'm teaching marine navigation. Uh, we quite often have to do a detour. You know, and we always do details of 60 degree turns. And uh, we time them exactly the same as we do in aviation. Right, so. Um, something to kind of, uh, you can get your head around that. Or if not, write it down and we'll go through it in a bit more detail when we um, do the, the revisions. So we've talked about how to recover back onto our original um, track and how we make a closing angle uh, once we know uh, uh, and we have how we can measure our tracker and our closing angle and how we can do uh, an adjustment in flight. Now, the next thing we need to cover is what happens 
when we get to point B and we look round and we can't find point B. And no matter how much we look round, there isn't a point B. So what are the options? Well, firstly, what I would do is have a quick look back at your plug that you've drawn up. And just re quickly recheck your uh, ETAs and your actual time of arrivals and, and your minutes. Because um, quite often when it goes over the hour um, and you've, you, you've got sort of like, uh, you've got four, seven, you've got to add um, 28, minutes to it to work out your next one um when you're on the ground it's very easy to um sort of add 28 to 47 and work out how many minutes past that is on the hour and you know subtract off the 60. but when you're flying a plane you know it, the mental arithmetic is is not always as easy as it sounds um and you quite often will have made a mistake on your ETA um, and typically you'd have added or subtracted 10 minutes of, of your ETA is a very, very common mistake. So just have a quick whiz through your math to make sure that you haven't produced a, a 10 minute error. Um, now, if you're not sure where you are, it's pointless kind of carrying on because I mean, if, if you're lost now, I mean, you know, there, there ain't going to be a miracle that suddenly gets you unlost. So what you would do is you would um, look at the map and you'd look at your ground features. You look at what you can see. And you try to relate what you can see to the map. So you'd look at a road, you'd look at your motorways, you'd look at the river and you'd say, well, where's where's the roads? Where's where's the rivers? Um, how does that relate to what I can see on the map? Um, now, when you're as you're flying along, you've drawn a line on the map, and you're following that line. So what you can do is you can put kind of extra things on the map. So um, like it have extra waypoints. Now, when I say extra waypoints, I don't mean like you've worked out um, times and distances and all that sort of gear. But supposing you've got like, when we was talking about the map of the UK, Suppose you've got that memory mask is roughly halfway along your track. And then when you get there, you you make a note of it. You think, oh, there we go. There's that mask. Yeah. And yet that's about halfway along my track. That means that if you actually get to where you actually want to be and you're not there, at least you know that you could actually fly back to that memory mast because you know that's where that is. Um, so in other words, you can always fly back to somewhere you can guarantee um, uh, you're, you're going to be, uh, you know, that you've already found on your way there anyway. And so that's that's really how, uh, how, how you recover from um, get, getting yourself lost. Now there's no, hard and fast sort of textbook ways of recovering from a loss. All I'm doing is giving you some ideas. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, you're the captain. Yeah, you know, you've got to make the decision. Um, what are you what are you going to do? And what decision you make will be a function of what sort of area is around you. Yeah, you know, whether you've got 
um, hills, um, controlled airspace, um, whether or not it's easy to get back to where you were. Um, you know, all, all these different things will, will require different different solutions. Um, if you still can't find out where um, where you are, well. Your only real option is phone a friend. And um, who are you going to call, Ross? Well, your uh, radar service that you're on. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well done. Yes, absolutely. Um, Lanaka, Lanaka Radar. My brother, Charlie, India Yankees. Temporary uncertain of our position. Um, can you give give me a heading to um, uh, uh, what's that big turning point begins with M that they like to route you by that you can never find? Um, you know the one I mean. It's at the top of a hill that's got a little abbey on it that's like similar looking to all the other hills anyway you could ask them for a radar vector to there um and then monastery yeah yes and and that they would um they would just give you a radar vector to fly there um and they but i mean that and they would also tell you how long it's going to take you to get there and, and things like that so um you know they'd much rather you say that you can't, you're not really sure where you are, could and request a radar vector to some Mosfalotti. That was it, Mosfalotti, and ask for a radar vector to Mosfalotti, than stumble around lost and and wander into the controlled airspace and start grounding aircraft and lots of paperwork and things. You know. Um, in fact, if you talk to any air traffic control and say, hi, I'm a light aircraft and I'm lost, can you help me? I can guarantee that they won't say, no, piss off, I'm too busy. Because if you say I'm a light aircraft and I'm lost, that becomes their number one problem that they've got to solve. Because they can't on their radar screen have A380s flying around and some knobhead in a light aircraft flying around with them who doesn't know where he is they will suddenly go oh shit alarm bells i've got a situation which i need to fix and providing you talk to air traffic control and you're honest you won't get into trouble um you know they will sort it they would they will sort it out and, and help and help you you know and uh, you know we've all been there The only other thing I want to talk about is, or a couple of other things regarding lost, is that um, most of the time when pilots get lost, low hour pilots get lost, it's not because they got this wrong. It's not because they can't navigate. It's because what happens is they get caught in bad weather. And they start to deviate off course. So they think, oh shit, there's a cloud. I just need to turn left a little bit. Oh bugger, there's another cloud. Shit, I need to climb a bit. And what they do is instead of flying, they start deviating all round and flying all the way around the bloody sky. Um, and they 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 then start missing their waypoints and, and all sorts of things. And before you know it, with the bad visibility and the fact that you've got clouds in the way, the fact that you can't see the ground as a picture, because what happens is, even though you're, you're VFR and you're clear of cloud in sight of surface, um, you're, not in, you're not in sight of the whole surface. You're in sight of little splodges of it, you know. 
and it can be very disorientating and very easy to get yourself lost if, if the weather starts to come down. Um, if you start to find yourself struggling as a PPO, what's what's the one heading that's always the safe heading to pick, Nick? 180. 180 degrees back to where you started. Absolutely. That's always the best heading to to, to pick is is when you start to feel a little uncomfortable, go back to where you, where you started. Um, uh, it's not in the exam, but it's in the ASA syllabus. I need to talk about remote navigation, uh, remote areas. Um, we do have remote areas in Cyprus, particularly if you're flying off to um, smaller islands. Um, you'll find, I mean, luckily the first big island near us is um, Crete, which is uh, huge. But you know, you've got to think to yourself, um, what sort of precautions would I take if I'm flying around featureless terrain where I haven't got waypoints to update my um, uh, a navigation with um and really the the obvious answer is well take something with you that like solves this problem um so in other words take a gps with you um take additional radios um if you seriously think you might there's a chance of getting a problem where you might finish up um, in a remote area, take survival equipment with you. Make sure you've submitted a flight plan so that people know that you're going to be flying over a remote area. Make sure that in this survival equipment, your life raft or whatever it's going to be, you know, you've got food, you've got your mobile phone, you've got a radio, you've got an EPIRB, um, whatever. Uh, and the last thing, uh, before we move on to the next subject I need to talk about, um, in the exams, all these, if you've got easy maths questions, then chances are that you misread the question. So uh, when it's referring to gallons, make sure you You've converted gallons to litres, you've converted kilograms to pounds, you've converted centigrade, uh, Fahrenheit to centigrade. You know, make sure that you've converted all the units. Um, called, you, know, uh, you can remember, you can always use your, uh, your little whiz wheel um, and uh, we can convert from, uh, you know, you can convert from uh, U.S. gallons to imperial gallons. Um, we've already talked about how you can convert yards to meters, um, uh, yards to feet, um, nautical miles, statute miles. Um, we will. Uh, we've already talked about how you can convert units. Right. So. What I want to do now is start talking a little bit about um, whoops, oh piss, I would have done if I hadn't torn it in half. Right, so the last part of navigation. We talk, we've covered now everything to do with visual navigation. Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk now about radio navigation.
So why do we actually need extra navigation aids? What is the purpose of all these things like VORs, um, NDBs, um, ADFs and uh, GPS? Um, what is the what is the point of it all? Well, visual navigation is exactly that, visual navigation. In other words, we're looking at the ground um, and we are flying from one waypoint to the next waypoint to the next waypoint. But most of the time when we're flying, um, we might not want to fly from waypoint to waypoint to waypoint. We might just want to draw a line. And maybe the line that we, we want to draw uh, doesn't go through nice waypoints and villages and dams and forest and monasteries and things that we can find and motorway junctions and masts and things. Yeah, maybe our line is just a line that just doesn't seem to cross anything. Um, and, you know, and we don't want to go sort of wiggle up here, down here, across here, up here, down here, down here to fly there. We just want to go directly. Um, so that's one reason why we use Radio 8. Um, but the, the biggest reason is, of course, that the weather may be bad. And maybe that we have to get from A to B. And it doesn't matter what the weather is, you know, we're going to have to get from A to B. And uh, we're going to have to just fly in the crappy weather where we just can't see where we're going. And we've got to be able to very precisely navigate even when we can't see the ground. Um, and this is this is why uh, radio aids come into it. Now, from a pilot's perspective, from a PPL perspective, um, you generally get bad weather situa situations, not when you're getting from A to B, you know, you always get them from when you've got to point B and you've spent the night at B and you've got to get back to A the following day. And of course, you know, you've got to get back, you got, haven't got any choice, and the weather is crap. Um, now, as a PPL, of course, your options are extremely limited because you can only fly um, uh, a victim. Uh, you can only really fly uh, uh, Victor Foxtrot Romeo and Victor Mike Charlie, can't you? Um, you can't fly. IFR, that isn't an option um, without an instrument rating. So you would have to spend an extra night to wait or just wait until the weather uh, clears up. Um, or typically in a flying club scenario when that happens, you would have to um, ring, air tr ring your flying club on, on, on your phone and you say, look, I'm stuck in France, I'm stuck here. Can you somebody come out who's got an instrument rating and fly me home, please? And uh, that happens a lot in flying clubs. And a, and a flying club is never going to turn around to you and say, um, don't be stupid, you flew all the way to La you know, <laughs> you get yourself back. You know, they will always say, you know, Yes, fine, we'll come and rescue you. Put the phone down and think, Rawr. you know, I'm now going to go all the way to La Touque and bring the bloody plane back. But they all, you know, they won't worry about it because they don't want you to fly in crap weather. So, we've already, um, uh, uh, Ross, I think, has already mentioned the fact that um, that first method of, nav of navigating when we don't know where we are is to talk to air traffic control. Now, 
back in the days of the um, Second World War, the uh, and when Britain started to get and the Americans got a bit of an upper hand, and um, they were flying long range bombing missions, and um, they would deliberately fly long range bombing missions in the crap weather. Because let's face it, if you're flying at night in the crap weather, it's going to be awfully difficult for a guy on the ground with a gun to kind of shoot you out the sky, isn't it? Um, and the British and Americans um, started to lose an awful lot of planes doing that. And they didn't lose the planes because the Germans were shooting them down. They were losing the planes because they would crash them um, flying back to their home airfields and they would get themselves lost and wouldn't be able to land or they would try to land but their airfield in bad weather and they'd crash into the runway or fly off the side of the runway or something like this. So they they start to put a lot of work into um, providing these extra navigation aids and to a large extent the ones we use nowadays are all based on the ones that were developed throughout the Second World War and all that technology. And the first one they introduced was what's called um, VHF direction finding. So what is, uh, how does VHF direction finding work? It's called VDF. Well, the way it works is that if you're in, in an aeroplane, And you're talking to an air traffic control tower, and you're transmitting a radio signal to um, an air traffic control tower. If this air traffic control tower has two aerials, let's say stuck on the roof here. As you transmit your signal, it's going to hit these two aerials at a slightly different time. So it will hit this second aerial um, slightly later, and because of the uh, the speed of light, and it's going to take this extra time to get to this extra aerial. Now, what you, what they they developed uh, as the very first means of of navigation is on the top of the control tower. Um, what they would do is they would put an aerial on each corner. You'd have four aerials on, on the control tower. And then inside the control tower, they would have um, a display. And every time you press the transmit button, um, on this display, it would flash in green. It would show where you're transmitting from. So it would actually sort of go, it would actually sort of go like this. It would go, go you'd say, um, Beacon Hill Tower, this is Bomber 39er. Request VDF, and it would see as you as you'd be transmitting, and it would show this green flash on the screen, and their screen would obviously be um, sort of calibrated. You know, it, it would show this is like uh, maybe um, 
uh, it, maybe this would be um, sort of on the ground to, to match. So this might be uh, north, this might be 90 over here, this would be sort of 270, this would be 160. And the fact it's got this green flash here, it would know that you're here 260 degrees. Bomber 3-9er, 260 degrees. And he, he, and he would say 260 degrees, and he'd say like class Alpha Bravo, which is a width of this green signal, depending on how good a heading he thought he could give you. Now, if you were a, a long way away, this green flash that appears on this screen would be like a great big one and it wouldn't be that accurate but if you were fairly close to the um, tower this green thing would be a very very fine line just a very and you'd see exactly where you are and we call this BGF BHF direction finding. And this is a feature, um, uh, this is unique to VHF, by the way, um, where with VHF, you can always, you can, you can always find out where VHF comes from. You can't do this with other frequencies. It's unique to VHF, um, but you, you, it's not that difficult to, to know exactly where a signal is, a VHF signal is, um, is coming from. So this is the very first sort of instrument that was there. And this was what's called a long persistence um, cathode ray tube. So in other words, these green sprodges would go, and then it'd take a long time to die down to go away. They've been replaced obviously nowadays by digital versions because um, they discovered after about 30 years people that sat in front of these looking at them all day developed all sorts of dodgy um, radiation and sickness problems and they produced lots of x-rays and horrible things that um, uh, people weren't aware of back in the sort of like uh, uh, late 40s, early 50s. Um, so uh, I've got a nice slide of that. Let me just um, bring up a slide on VHF direction finding. Um, I'm looking for what page am I looking for? Page 75. Right. Nowadays, I suspect if you called up air traffic control and said request QDM, um, most air traffic controllers would have to get the book out and sort of say, no, I did study that 20 years ago when I studied air traffic control. And I've probably completely forgotten about it. And probably the equipment's in the corner gathering dust. Right, so this is this is basically what the equipment on the ground uh, looks like. It's just a cathode ray tube, big green cathode ray tube, and um, so here's a typical example: um, big and approach golf mic whiskey request QDM. So QDM is the old, is the Q code name that was invented in the Second World War. Um, to just basically mean, can you tell me whereabouts I am relative to you? So you'd say request QDM. 
and um, the, ra the uh, radar operator would then look at his radar screen and he would um, uh, tell you what whereabouts you are relative to him. And uh, there's various words and terms that we come across. Um, now, I'm telling you all this because there are exam questions on this, and there's quite often an exam question on all this um, Q, uh, QDM and VDFs um, stuff. I know it's a load of crap because you're never going to use it. Um, because GPS has quite honestly taken its place. But these are the things you need to know. So if you say request QDM, then that's your magnetic bearing to the station. In other words, M meaning magnetic. Yeah, magnetic bearing. That's how I always remember it. Um, in other words, if you say request QDM, he would say, Go for India Yankee, QDM 250. And he would also then give a class. So he'd say Q, two, QDM 260 class alpha. And these are the various classes, alpha, bravo, Charlie, delta, which is how accurate the QDM is. In other words, how wide this green splodge is on his radar screen. And you could probably imagine that with all of this, the um, the the controller could actually then give you uh, other types of um, uh, constant QDMs and things to actually um, get you back on. Uh, back to there. Right, let's talk. Um, I want to talk a bit about homing and tracking now. Um, they mentioned it here, but they haven't really explained it very well. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, something a bit more interesting homing and tracking. So I'll explain this um, in terms of a, a missile. I mean, it's something obviously which I have a no lot of knowledge on based on my past life. Um, but let's supposing we want to uh, shoot down an aeroplane and the, 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 uh, we, we've got a, a jet here that we're going to shoot down. And uh, We've got a heat seeking missile and we want to fire our heat seeking missile towards this heat source here. Now, obviously, our missile is going to be heading, heading off up here at maybe Mach 2.5, something like that. And this will be flying at, at Mach. 1.3 or something like that. Um, so this is moving and our missile is going to be going up towards it. Now, what we want to do is, is as this is moving across the sky here, we want our missile to kind of go here, don't we? But life isn't like that. What happens is our missile is a bit of a stupid missile. And so what happens is our missile starts heading towards the red, the heat signature. But the plane then comes here. 
this is going to be our plane. So the missile is now going to turn to the plane there. By the time it's got to here, our plane is here. So now our missile is going to be turning there. And then by the time our missile hits the plane here, our missile, you can probably see, has had to go all the way here, and it's gone all the way there, and it's always going to hit it straight up the arse in the same direction the plane is travelling from. And if the missile had any sense, it wouldn't have done this massive part here, it would have just gone that way. But missiles don't have any sense. That's why they, that's why what happens is they're guided and then they call it. Um, so we have the same problem when we're flying though in a, in a plane in that, let's say for example, we want to we want to get to here. And we've got a wind, then if we've got the wind is blowing here. If I know where this point is, and I just point my plane to it, what's going to happen when I, 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 I know I've got a QDM or whatever, it doesn't matter, an NDB or VOR, whatever, I'm just going to point my plane towards that, that there, and I'm going to fly towards it. Where am I going to finish up? Well, I'm not going to finish up there, am I? I'm actually going to go. I'm actually going to finish up going here, aren't I? Because the wind is going to blow me to the right. So I'm already off course. Um, so now I ask for another QDM, or I get another position fix, and I work out where my top, where my my um, uh, where I want to go actually is. And I go, oh, piss. Okay, not to worry. Right, what I'll do is I now know my new heading to there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now turn and fly straight towards it again. But of course, what you know now, as I turn straight towards it, the wind, once again, I'm not going to be able to go straight towards it. I'm going to finish up going over here again. So I go, so now I, so I do another position call here. And I go, oh, bloody hell, it's now up there. Okay, then, not to worry. Right, so I, I'm going to head straight up here. But of course, I try to go there. But of course, I finish up going there, don't I? Because the wind is going to blow me off course again. So then I get to here and I go, Ah, oh, hang on, it's over there. So what I do is I fly straight to there, but of course I can't fly straight to there because the wind will blow me off course and the wind will blow me over here. So can you see what is happening is that um, th this, this is what we call homing. And we have exactly the same problem as the missile in that if we just keep aiming towards something all the time, we will always finish up arriving at it into wind. In other words, it's not until I get to here and I go, where is it? And it says, and I now know it's there, and I fly straight towards it there. But of course, because I'm now flying into the wind, I don't get any errors because I don't get any, I don't get blown off course. 
So that means that if I don't take into account the wind and I want to fly from here to here, I will always, by getting lots of position, Eric, I will always fly this course. Just like our missile, I will always finish up flying straight behind it or straight into wind. So how on earth could I get from here to here directly? Right, so what I could do is when I'm here, I could get a heading to fly to there, just like we did before, which is there. But I'm still going to get blown to here. But what I could do is because I now know that I got blown to there, then maybe what I could do is when I get this new heading here, instead of flying that heading there and know that I'm going to get blown there, maybe I could fly this heading here. And I know now that I'm going to get, I now know I'm going to finish up flying here. In other words, what happened is I'd be flying my plane, pointing it slightly left all the time, like this. And I'd be tracking to the top to my destination. So we call we call this homing and this is tracking. So you can probably already start to see now the secret of all radio navigation is how to actually track to your target as opposed to home to your target. And we're going to, I think we'll stop there because this whole thing of tracking and homing is part of is is in is um, endemic to everything to do with radio navigation, and it doesn't just matter if we're using old-fashioned um, BDF requesting QDMs, or when that we're using NDB, VOR, or the very latest GPS tracking. It this is the same problem all the time. Even if you're on your GPS and you find out where this point is, and our GPS tells me that it's on this example here, it's zero three zero. If you just point your plane onto zero three zero and hold zero three zero, it won't stay zero three zero zero three zero for long because. It's the same old problem with our GPS. As soon as we go on to here and we point our plane to, the, to where we want to go, we won't get there. We will finish up flying this blue route, not the green route. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about uh, VDF, radar, VOR, um, ADF, NDB, and GPS um, radio navigation. And we're going to be talking about how we convert simple homing information into tracking information. In other words, how we can then take all of those that and convert this into a method of getting from here to here, offsetting the wind. So I think we'll call it quits there because we've covered quite a bit tonight.